Kamera, mhm. ja. So, hello everybody. Welcome to our Biozyme Webinar Wednesday. My name is Monika Burbach and I'm product manager for biochemicals at Biozyme and I have been working in the field of molecular biology, biochemistry for the last 20 years. It is great to see that so many of you could join us for our webinar today. I'm very happy that Dr. Michael Hannus from Cytus Biotech is with us today to give us an insight of simplifying ribosome profiling and introducing the side factor. Um, at the end of the session, there will be time to have a discussion and answer all your questions. Please type your questions into the chat box whenever you like. We will answer them at the end of the session. Thank you in advance for your input. Okay, that is all for me now. Michael, please feel free to make a start. Yeah, welcome everybody as well. Um, again, it's my pleasure to talk about ribosome profiling um, and um, uh, in our efforts to basically bring a very complicated um, um, to um, uh, methods that can be applied in every lab. Um, right, so here we change the slide. Good. So first, uh, first slide, just a quick introduction of the company. We are Cytoids Biotech. I'm the founder and CEO. We are based in Munich and we are spin out of Interna Bioscience and the University of Regensburg. Um, we're a team of scientists and our core expertise was initially RNA, um, RNA interference. And um, from there, we moved into RNA-seq, which again brought us into ribosome profiling, which um, I will be talking about in this talk. Okay, so um, ribosome prof profiling, why do we need yet another omics method? So with all respect to RNA and its importance, um, obviously in the end, we have to understand proteins and um, how they're generated and how their expression is controlled. And if you look at the, at the graph to the left-hand side, you see um, the median count for mRNAs, which is 17, and then the median count for proteins, which is 50,000. So obviously there's a massive amplification step in between, which as everything biology is regulated. And this is also nicely shown by the figure on the right-hand side, which correlates the um, mRNA count with the, uh, with the count of the corresponding protein. And as you see, there is a correlation there, but um, the, the square of um, the correlation coefficient is 0.4. That basically means that only 40% um, um, of the abundance of proteins is actually explained by the abundance of the mRNA. So from this, again, you see that there's a lot of regulation happening on a translational level, which is why we have to understand that if you want to understand proteins. Um, now, There are very well-established methods, high-throughput methods for sequencing DNA and, and RNA. Um, so, um, and um, now it would be very nice. Um, and yeah, so basically it's, we can very easily and very straightforward quantify DNA and RNA broadly in, in systems. And obviously there's also protein mass spec, which however is associated with a lot of other complications protein modification and so on. So it would be nice if you could use these high throughput sequencing methods to look further towards protein, um, towards protein abundance. And that's exactly in this gap between um, RNA-seq and um, mass spec, that's exactly where you can position ribosome profiling. So what you do there um, at the core is you do not sequence mRNAs, as you would normally do in standard RNA-seq, but you sequence only those parts of the mRNA that are protected, they're inside a ribosome. That means that are currently just being translated. And just um, as a piece of nomenclature, a bit of an echo in the line. I hope that's not bad for you. I can hear something. I hope you can still hear me well. So uh, just just for this, um, for understanding the rest of this talk, well, please keep this um, Abbreviation, RPF in mind, it's a ribosome protected fragment. That's exactly those 30 bases that are inside a ribosome. 
So it's of course would be cool to know what those 30 bases are because you would then see where on an mRNA the ribosomes are. You could, if you had the, if you could quantify those RPFs, you could know which mRNAs actually actively translated, and you could also see how efficiently mRNAs are translated. So it's a whole different level of information that you can gain if only you could exclusively sequence those RPFs, and that's actually ribosome profiling. So the method is relatively long and complicated and can be divided up in four steps. So the first is the sample preparation. You can use different samples very frequently. It's tissue culture, uh, human and mouse, but you can also use model organisms. Uh, yeast, for instance, works well. Um, actually also Drosophila, um, C. elegans, and so on. So the next step is the preparation of these RPFs. And in the first step, basically, you have to um, generate a lysate, which you subject to a nucleolytic digest. So you basically, you add RNAs that chew away all the mRNA that are not protected by a ribosome. So then you basically end up with the ribosomes in a lysate, obviously, with the ribosomes um, containing this RPF. Because um, you, I will also refer to those as, as monosomes. And those have to be purified which you can do with a, um, a number of methods, one of them being density gradation, centrifugation, and, and fractionation. And I'll come to that in a sec. Um, then you do RNA extraction and a size selection using a preparative page. So after this, um, um, and with this page, you end up with your RPFs. Once you have the RPFs, you have to generate a sequencing library from this. Um, this is, again, a complicated procedure for which, again, we um, hope to um, uh, provide improvements soon. And finally, there's a bi bioinformatics analysis, which I will not be talking about in this um, webinar. So um, let me just drill a bit deeper into this first step, the preparation of the RPFs. So because basically, whilst the sequencing and the, the, the preparation of the library is relatively standardized, there's quite a bit of variability in this RPF preparation step. So basically because ribosome profiling is used for a whole number of different questions and depending on what your questions are you can adjust that. For instance there are different ways in which you can generate these lysates. For instance you can harvest the cells, you can block ribosomes by adding drugs and so on. You can apply different RNAs digests. You can do different kinds of monosome preparations and different types of RNA isolation. So there's a whole lot of variability that you have there to specify, specify the answer you want, and then you continue with library preparation and sequencing. <clears throat> Just to maybe highlight again the first part, so for instance, what are the variations here? And so for instance, when it comes to nucleases, there's a whole number of different nucleases you can use. A standard nucleus that people use um, is RNAs. One, the advantage of that is that it has basically no sequence bias. It will just cleave anywhere. Um, there's some challenges in some species. For instance, you can't use this in E. coli because it is from E. coli. And it's relatively hard to block. There's only one monoclonal antibody from Ambion that you can use to block it. An alternative to this is the micrococcal nuclease. And some people actually also use mixtures, also depending on how hard and how stringent you want to do this digest. When it comes to a monosome preparation, right, so that's the preparation, again, of the ribosomes with the RPF inside, the different um, approaches again. So, for instance, you can do a gel filtration with simple spin columns. So this is the quick and dirty approach. Um, but maybe when you have many samples, that may be one approach. You can do a sucrose gradient, a uh, sucrose cushion, which already requires quite a bit of specialized equipment, takes a lot of time doesn't give you quality control. Now, the let's say the, the gold standard, the best approach to do this is actually to run a proper sucrose gradient to an ultra centrifugation and then fractionation. So the advantage of that, disadvantage maybe is again, you need specialized equipment to generate a sucrose gradient. Um, you, it's, it's, it takes additional time. However, you get very good control of the process. And I'll show you in a second, give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, so, um, just again to illustrate why it's, um, it's desirable to, to actually control well this process 
of um, of nucleus digest and to uh, to do um, gradient fractionation. So basically, here on these three graphs, you see um, so basically you see the elution profiles from um, a gradient um, a sucrose gradient centrifugation. Um, on the y-axis, you basically see absorbance of RNA, and what you can actually see when you're on the left gradient going from from left to right, you see basically that first you see the small subunits of the ribosome, the large subunit, and here basically you see the monosome, and this orange block, that's basically the fraction that you want to collect. And then as you move further to the right, you actually see polysomes. So these are multiple ribosomes that are still connected by a stretch of mRNA. And actually some people are also interested in that. Now, as you increase the intensity of the digest, you first lose the polysomes, and that may still be um, desirable for some applications. And finally, basically, you chew away everything. So again, just to highlight that, it's very important that you titrate this digest well. And again, proper um, gradient centrifugation and fractionation will help you to do just that. Now, to actually get a proper gradient or to get proper fractions from a centrifugation tube um, is not exactly trivial without um, a good um, with, with, with a, without good equipment for that. And because there was not, nothing really suitable, we actually developed um, such a tool. And um, Monica, you may want to start um, the video. Can you get it started? Yeah. So what you should be seeing here is a stage in which you can introduce now a centrifugation tube. So this is actually um, a tube that comes out of a, an ultra centrifugation rotor. And so if you first push it to the top where it's sealed and then you move the bottom part up. So now it's basically fixed between those to two um, positions. And now by turning at the bottom part, you actually insert a needle into the bottom of the tube. Um, actually, you should now see the tip of the needle appearing. Ah, here we go, here it is. So now the system is attached to an FPLC system, for instance, an actor or a similar system. And now you can see that sort of a pink solution is introduced from the bottom, pushing the gradient out of the tube into your FPLC system, where you can then have a flow cell. And Monica, can you go back to the, yeah, here you go. So you approach the flow cell, so you get basically a gradient and you can then pull different fractions. So it's a very convenient tool um, it gives you very reproducible fractions, it's easy to handle, and um, it's actually available for, for different rotors and for different tubes. So, um, yeah, and it's basically available as of um, this month. What you just saw in the movie was actually a beta type. In the meantime, we've produced, this is basically, this is the version that you'll finally see. Um, and um, yeah, we'll be happy to give you more information. If you're interested, maybe want uh, to know if this is not only good for ribosome profiling, but basically for any application that involves the fractionation of ultra centrifugation tubes. <clears throat> now, um, you may remember after you've basically purified your monosomes, um, you extract the RNA and to really get your, your RPFs, the ribosome protected fragments that should be about 30 bases in length, you have to use a preparative um, polyacrylamide gel. Um, and there again, it's critical that you actually cut out just the right spot. So it's a simple thing, but still very useful. We um, developed a marker that's specifically for that, uh, gives you accurately where you have to cut. And we also modified those markers such that you it will not end up in your library and contam contaminating your library. Um, right, now um, a notorious challenge, generally in RiboSeq, if you do not do poly A primed RiboSeq, is the contamination with ribosomal RNA. I mean, all of you are certainly aware that most of the um, RNA in a cell is actually ribosomal RNA. And um, if you do just a total RNA extract, most of what you would be sequencing is ribosomal RNA. Now, in, 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 in this case here, remember, we purified monosomes, so a ribosome with the, the 30 bases of mRNA inside. Most of what you have there in this preparation is ribosomal RNA. 
and again, remember, we digested it. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, frag fragments of um, of the ribosome um, in your preparation. Now, um, uh, what this figure actually shows you are samples that we got from different collaborators. And what we actually did here, we mapped the rRNA contaminations, you can see it in blue, along the 40S ribosomal RNA. So that's basically the precursor of, um, uh, of the ribosomal RNA. And what you can see, and these are different samples from different collaborators. And what you can see that basically all of them have contaminations at discrete spots, which are in fact sort of kind of loops that are more on the ribosome that are more access accessible to the nucleus. Now, the challenge when generating a depletion tool for ribosome profiling is that you have to cover those areas with a specifically, with especially abundant um, ribosomal contaminations. Um, generally, um, Cytos developed a tool for um, removing ribosomal RNA, which we call the ribopool. So those are biotinylated probes that hybridize with RNA. You can then pull those out using streptavidin beads, magnetic streptavidin beads, and then basically purify um, RNA that, um, that with close to no ribosomal RNA anymore. Um, we generate those rubber pools for a whole lot of different applications, different species, and so on, and now also for ribosome profiling. Um, as I've mentioned, the, the difficulty again um, is this enormous abundance, and you can actually see this in um, a slide that was provided by, by Jan Medenbach, who actually provided most of the figures here in this talk. Um, so what you can see here, again, is are the different ribosomal RNAs. And you can see here, you, you, we basically map the contaminations um, that you see here in the abundance to um, basically these ribosomal RNAs. And what you can see that they're very discrete, extremely high abundant um, contaminations, one here in 18S, and one here in 5.8s. And then there here, the less contaminant, the contaminants of less abundance. So in an iterative process, we basically developed a, um, a mix of probes that basically filter out those, but actually then also catch the other, um, the other contaminations. And basically thus increasing the amount of, um, the, um, of, of protein coding RPFs from six to 15%, which may not seem much, but it's a, basically a threefold increase, which is a great advantage if it comes to deep sequencing. <clears throat> now, um, coming to the next step. Now, once you have, let's see, you have, you've, now you've generated your, your RPFs, you've depleted your ribosomal RNA as much as you can, and now it comes, um, to generating the library. Again, the challenge here is that the fragments that you um, would like to bring into your library are extremely small, they're 30 bases long. And that requires basically specialized approach, a specialized um, chemistry, if you wish. So basically that starts with, that, with ligating the first adapter, reverse transcription, ligating a second adapter, um, then again, doing PCR, amplifying everything. And so basically, in the end, you have your tiny ribosome, um, RPF surrounded by basically library sequence. So um, the whole method was um, actually invented by um, Ingolia et al. in 2009. That was the primary publication in 2009. And it's actually a hardcore protocol. Um, it's really something just for experts. And um, maybe just most critically, or there, there are lots of actually difficult steps uh, associated with a lot of loss. And maybe most notably, there are three steps in which, in fact, you have to do um, age purification. So the whole, the whole process takes six days, requires, again, multiple amplifications, multiple such, such page purifications. It's very complicated. And I guess if you're not really an expert in that field, you're very likely to end up with nothing. So um, to make this a method that really can be applied also in a standard lab, that's based not just RNA experts, we, and that is actually mostly um, our collaborator and expert, Jan Medenbach, um, has been working 
on a massively accelerated protocol that um, gets rid of two of the three page purification steps that most, it's mostly solid phase extraction and that reduces the six day protocol to three days um, and makes it at the same time just a lot easier to handle. Um, so this is something that's basically still in development and that we really hope together with the other tools would bring massive improvements. Just to show you that this actually also works. Um, now this looks really a bit like hardcore RNA, but, um, by industry, but it's actually quite interesting. So what you see here is um, Jan basically used different inputs of RPFs um, in his library synthesis method. So from five picomole to 0.1 picomole. Just to keep in mind, five picomole is about 50 nanograms. 0.1 is basically one nanogram of RPF. So it's, we're talking about tiny amounts here. And um, then in the final amplification step, basically what you see here are the final amplification steps. And this here, this is the level um, at which um, you should start. And um, obviously these are um, polyacrylamide gels. And this is basically the level at which you should start seeing your library. And you see that again, we're getting a pretty bad noise in the line. I hope you can still hear me. Um, as you go lower, you basically require more cycles, but not an insane number. And you can actually go down as low as actually one nanogram of RPFs. And again, considering how difficult it is to get these RPFs, it's actually very critical that you need very little of it to generate a good library. Now, obviously the question is you can, you can amplify anything with PCR. So, so what do we actually amplify here? Is it, do those, those inserts make any sense? And just again, to recapitulate what, these, what the structure of this library is, right? So you have your RPF, your ribosome protected fragment, that's your fragment of sequence, 30 bases approximately, surrounded by two UMIs, unique molecular identifiers, and those together basically cover four million different variations. So you can have four million different um, RPFs in that library. So what Jan did here is um, he generated a library using five picomole and checked basically how many PCR duplicates do you have? So just to avoid the situation where basically you're left with nothing, which at the end you just amplify massively by PCR. And the cool thing is that less than 2% of what he sequenced are actually PCR duplicates. So, uh, what this shows you basically is that um, an enormous variety of RPFs really end up in this library and that you get no senseless over amplification by PCR in the end. So basically this means that this, this, this new method is, is very sensitive, requires very little amount of RPFs and is at the same time extremely efficient. Which actually already brings me to the summary. So I was trying to um, introduce again, first ribosome profiling and, and tell you um, about um, our contributions, bring this method down to a level that basically anybody can use it. So we have the rival pools, which should help to at least strongly reduce the amount of ribosomal RNA in your RPF preparations and increase the ratio of those things that you actually want to sequence, which are fragments of mRNA protected, which are the actual RPFs. So we um, have a little thing, the ribocard mark, which should just help you to very reproducibly cut out the right spot in your polyacrylamide gel, which you need to isolate your RPFs. So we generated um, a tool, the Cyfractor, which should strongly facilitate um, generating um, fractiona um, fractionating um, density gradient centrifugation tubes and um, get basically good control of your monosome purification. And lastly, um, we are working and I would say close to completion of actually generating a new library kit that should bring down the complexity of library synthesis massively, make it very efficient and just um, reduce it to about half the time. So this being said, I would like to thank 
the people that actually did most of that, which wasn't me, um, the very large part of what I've been presenting is actually work of uh, Jan Minmach, who is a junior group leader at the Department of Gunther Meister in Regensburg. So Jan's really been a pioneer in this entire work, and I really have to thank him for his great work and actually most of the graphics and slides that I've been presenting here. Gunther, obviously, for his general support um, of the whole project, um, project and, um, and uh, Benny Keplinger, who is, an, who is the engineer who um, developed um, the, the final, the, the cyphractor according to initial plans that um, Jan came up with. Um, and this being said, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks. Hey, um, thank you, Michael, for your interesting presentation. Um, if you are all located in Germany or Austria, please feel free to contact us at Biozyme for more information. You also can check out our website or contact your local Biozyme sales rep. People from other areas, please contact Citus directly. So now we are ready to answer your questions. Just type them into the chat box. Mm, okay, we can start with, um, are there special requirements for an FPLC system to use it with the Cyfractor? Okay, yeah, so, so I mean, principally, I was, what I was trying to get across is that the Cyfractor is a machine that's actually, that's quite versatile and can be hooked up with pretty much any FPLC system. Um, I think very commonly um, people doing RNA and protein biochemistry, they have an ECTA system around, um, but others should work as well. You need um, a pressure of about um, up, to, like up to 10 atmospheres um, to, to drive it just due to the size of the tubing and the resistance of the system. Um, right, but it, it should be very versatile with just about anything you have in your lab. That's the idea. Okay, I have a next one. Um, where could we find more information on the Cyfractor? You ask me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you ask me um, um, or Biozyme, and um, and we'll be happy to give you a lot of background on. Okay. The and I have an additional one. What is the best moment to perform ribosomal depletion? Ah, okay, that's an interesting one. So, so I guess ribosomal RNA, the ribosomal RNA depletion. I guess. So, yeah. so actually, that people are doing it in two steps. And um, so um, I know that some people actually do it before the preparative gel. And, um, and um, I mean, one issue there, and I, I've seen that working. So, um, and actually this, the rubber pool we, we provide covers actually gapless everything. I mean, I mean, the entire ribosomal RNA. So principally everything should, everything should be covered. However, as I'm trying to get across some part, some contamination are very abundant. So the pool, as we've now designed it and as we now sell it, um, is actually optimized for doing the depletion after, um, once you, you did, um, after the um, gel purification. But again, I've, I've seen both. Okay, and, uh... and then one, one, one word to say, I mean, <laughs> if you have a special application and you, um, we can actually also do a customized rubber pool for you. Um, if if you have like yeah special needs yeah okay great so our last questions for now for today uh, would be what level of rna depletion can i expect with the riboseq ribo pools ah okay yeah. so again <laughs> um so um I mean, you saw the one slide that I showed um, on the human system. Again, it was data provided by Jan. Um, and in human, actually, it's it's actually fairly difficult difficult to really get like a high, uh, very high um, fraction of uh, actually really coming from RPFs. So reaching maybe 50 or 20% is actually already high. In other systems, for instance, in Drosophila, it was relatively easy to get like 50%. Um, of the um, of the um, of the RPFs actually coming from from mRNA, so it really depends a lot um, on the system. It is it is not like a normal RNA seq where you get 90, 98, 99 percent. So you you will ha have to deal with less, but still, 
even if let's say the absolute number is low, let's say in human, the 50% I said, if you bring it up from 5% to 15%, it's still a factor of three, means you have to sequence threefold less than you would otherwise have to do without um, depletion. It will very much depend on, on your system. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, we are still some question left. So uh, for our dear customers, we will, send you an email and answer your question afterwards because now we have to stop our webinar. I wish you all a wonderful afternoon and thank you very, very much for your attention. Bye. Bye. -bye.